Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. We finished in our last lesson studying what Jesus said about John the Baptist. Then we began to look at the account of the sinner woman who anointed Jesus' feet at a banquet given by a Pharisee. This is where we will pick up in this episode. I really love this account of the sinner woman weeping tears of repentance at the feet of Jesus. It's easy for me to put myself in her place and find at the feet of Jesus the sweet forgiveness he freely offers to repentant sinners, and how he joyfully accepts those prodigals that come to their senses and run home to the open arms of Jesus. As an evangelist, I love to see the Holy Spirit move with convicting power to bring people to repentance and the transforming power of God. Tears that are shed in heartfelt repentance are sweet to Jesus, and they aren't shed in vain. The final point Jesus made when he confronted the Pharisees and experts in the Mosaic Law we find in Luke chapter 7, verses 34 and 35. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say he is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by all her children. Under the anointing of the Spirit, Luke made the perfect transition from our Lord's statement that wisdom is justified by all her children, to the account of the sinner woman. In this story, we see the wisdom of God embracing a repentant sinner while passing by the self-righteous Pharisee. The religious Jews were just as wicked as a sinner woman. The only difference is that the woman understood her spiritual condition, while the pompous Pharisees and teachers of the Mosaic Law were willfully blind to theirs. In the account of this immoral woman's repentance, we only examine verses 36 through 38 that gave us the context of the event and how the woman gave clear expression of deep, authentic repentance. I want to read these three verses to refresh our memory and then make a couple of passing points. We will then dig into the rest of the account. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, so he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume, and as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. One minor similarity I didn't mention in our last lesson about the sinner woman in this account and that of Mary, the younger sister of Lazarus, is that the perfume in both accounts came in an alabaster jar. Alabaster is a fine granule type of gypsum that varies in color from white to shades of beige and can have veins within it of many different colors. It also has a certain translucence to it, and the soft nature of the material means that it can easily be carved and fashioned into usable items. This makes it a useful material for ornamental objects such as figurines and vases, or for practical purposes such as lamp bases and jars. In the account of the sinner woman, we aren't told if the perfume was very expensive, like that of the rare spikenard in the account of Mary, when she anointed the head of Jesus six days before he was crucified. Though this is minor, it's another similarity that makes it seem like this woman in both accounts is the same Mary that was the sister of Lazarus and Martha. Another point along this line, but one that is rather big, is that in this account Jesus forgives the woman of her life of sin. While in the latter, Jesus declared that she was preparing for his burial. There's every indication in the latter account that Mary was a disciple of Jesus, who was well known to the disciples and the people at the banquet. In the earlier account, the woman is only known according to the life of sin she lived and was despised for it. There are other points that I haven't mentioned in these two accounts that reveal they were different events, but the same woman. Now let's look at verse 39 that partially reveals the character and spiritual condition of the Pharisee who invited Jesus to eat at his home. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. It's obvious from this verse that the Pharisee wasn't convinced that Jesus was a genuine prophet, much less the promised Messiah. From all the actions of this religious man, there aren't any indications that he even liked Jesus. Though this banquet appears to have been given in the honor of Jesus, the real motive behind it appears to be an effort to entrap him in some sly way. When the sinner woman began to weep at the feet of Jesus, the Pharisee must have thought, I've got you now. 
No true prophet would let such a woman touch him. The Old Testament doesn't state that such an act was sin. Simon believed it was sin because he held to the distorted verbal traditions of the rabbinical teachers. Jesus confronted some Pharisees over this exact issue in Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Though the scribes, Pharisees, and lawyers would deny that they had placed the teaching of the elders on an equal plane with Scripture, this was the fact of the matter. At times they even held their traditions above Scripture and would break the law in the name of keeping the tradition of the elders. Jesus confronted this exact thing in Matthew chapter 15, verse 3. Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? In our account of the sinner woman, the Pharisee refused to show compassion to supposedly uphold ritual purity as defined by the rabbinical traditions. The Pharisee was deeply offended by Jesus' act of compassion toward this repentant woman. We studied a couple of lessons back our Lord's warning on not being offended over his person and teaching. As we will see a little later, the Pharisee was extremely disrespectful to Jesus, and this was very purposeful. Simon meant to insult Jesus before all his guests to show that he didn't approve of Jesus and wasn't one of his disciples. How the Pharisee judged Jesus is the kind of judging that's condemned by the Savior in the Word of God. This is judging the motives of a person, which is something that we are forbidden to do. Simon also judged a sinner woman that was in the throes of deep, life-changing repentance. More than likely, Simon thought that he was justified in judging Jesus and the sinner woman, and thought that he knew the truth about them both. What a hypocrite! In spite of the fact that Jesus bore in superabundance the spiritual fruit that revealed he was Messiah, the Pharisee dismissed it all. Those enslaved to legalism are often extremely critical of others, while being blind to their own sin, and this was certainly the case with Simon. The Pharisee sinned in his heart by bringing charges against Jesus that he wasn't a true prophet, and by implication that Jesus was a false prophet because he was letting this sinner woman touch him. Simon erroneously believed that if Jesus was a bona fide prophet, he would have discerned the lifestyle of this woman and would have denounced her with prophetic judgments. Jesus correctly discerned this woman's spiritual and moral condition. Since the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost, he was at that very moment finding a lost sheep that had wandered into a den of wolves. Jesus didn't refuse the society of the guilty. Just look. He was reclining at the table with a wicked Pharisee and eating from the same common bowl. All those who come to Jesus, no matter how wicked a life they lived, will find a friend that's willing to rescue them. They must be conscious that they are deeply depraved and are at least beginning to mourn over the crimes that they have committed against God and people. The differences between Jesus and Simon are striking in many ways. One such contrast is how the Pharisee incorrectly judged Jesus and the sinner woman, while Jesus correctly judged the heart and mind of the woman and the Pharisee because he literally knew what was inside of them. Another is that the Pharisee condemned Jesus and the woman, though he didn't know their heart, while Jesus truly knew what was inside the heart and mind of the woman and the Pharisee, but didn't judge them as their sins deserved. Jesus knew the heart, mind, and motives of this man and was going to confront him over certain of his hypocrisies. In verse 40, Jesus begins to lay out the rebuke. The verse reads, Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Here we get a glimpse of the divinity of Christ. Jesus answered the statement that the Pharisee had just thought, and this must have shaken the man. In typical Jesus fashion, he was going to give a little parable and then apply it to the situation. Before Jesus did this, he asked Simon if he could say something to him, which put the man in a position of having to respond to Jesus in a proper manner before all of his guests. Jesus was being like Nathan the prophet who confronted King David over his unrepentant sins of adultery and murder. Nathan began his rebuke with a parable and forced the king to pronounce his own guilt before he had time to even know what happened. Then Nathan announced divine judgment on David for the evil he perpetrated. Jesus' parable is found in verses 41 and 42. Two men owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. 
Now which of them will love him more? The parable is easy to understand, even for an unregenerated religious man. The two debtors in the parable are the sinner woman, who owes the greater debt, and Simon, who owes the lesser. The shameless woman owes ten times the amount as the outwardly upright Simon, who is also a sinner, and this is seen in the proportion of five hundred to fifty. Neither are able to pay their debt, so both will be sold into slavery to pay their debt. Their only hope was for the moneylender to show mercy. To obtain mercy they both had to ask for mercy, though in the parable it appears that neither asked for their debt to be forgiven. They would only ask for mercy when they saw that it was impossible for either of them to pay their debt. As long as they thought they could pay their debt, they would not ask for mercy. Both were equally forgiven, and it is sheer mercy that the money lender forgave them. In verse 43, Simon sheepishly replied to Jesus, saying, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Through this parable, Simon was forced to acknowledge that the greater debtor would love the money lender more for the mercy of forgiveness that was shown to him. Simon was caught in a divine trap. If Jesus would have outrightly rebuked the Pharisee, it's more than likely that he would have rejected what Jesus had to say. But now that he was led into an attitude where he could hear the rebuke, there was greater hope that he might respond correctly. We mustn't read into this more than what Jesus was striving to accomplish in the life of this religious hypocrite. In the parable, the debtors were freely forgiven by the lender, and in one sense this is true about Jesus, for he does freely forgive. But we must never believe that his forgiveness comes apart from the atonement in our repentance. This means that we must not only see the colossal debt we owe God over our sin and sin nature, but must take the path of repentance where we acknowledge our debt and cry out for divine mercy to be forgiven. Now we come to the serious rebuke Jesus gives Simon. The fact that Jesus drew him into the parable would have made it a little easier for the self-righteous man to receive it. Verse 44 reads, Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. The first point of this verse is very important, and to appreciate it we must understand Jewish culture from 2,000 years ago how they perceived the role of women, and how they were treated. In some nations and cultures of that day, women were treated a little better than slaves. Out of the known world, the Jews had the highest regard for women and treated them with the greatest respect. There were distinct roles, though, and those roles were kept, except under extreme circumstances. One example of this is that women were not allowed to testify in a court of law. An exception of this is seen in Jesus' parable of the persistent widow. There was also proper protocol how men and women were to interact with each other. If a man was a traveling merchant and wanted to send his wife or daughter a letter, he would address it to their son, for it wasn't proper for a man to send a woman a letter. If the husband and wife didn't have a son, the husband would send the letter in the name of the son they didn't have. When you look at the account with the sinner woman, we see Jesus going directly against one of those taboos, which was to never compare a man with a woman. For Jesus to look at the repentant woman while speaking to Simon would have been taken as an insult. Then to compare the failures of Simon with the humble actions of the woman would be a further insult. This reproof was even greater given that the woman was a sinner who was being compared to a devoutly religious man. I can only imagine that as Jesus did this that the people were looking on with gaping mouths in utter astonishment. Jesus knew what he was doing. He wasn't ignorant of the cultural norms. Jesus was helping this proud man see that he too was a sinner, just like the woman, though in degrees there may have been a difference, but in substance there was none. Jesus said to Simon, Do you see this woman? Oh, he definitely saw her and thoroughly despised her in spite of her repentance and agony of soul. Jesus then said, I came to your house, which would have been by invitation of Simon. Yet the Pharisee didn't offer Jesus any of the usual rites of hospitality according to the Middle Eastern culture of 2,000 years ago. Simon deliberately insulted Jesus in an effort to disgrace him before all of his guests, but he failed. It's plain that the Pharisee despised Jesus. Simon failed to understand that the holy character of Christ didn't have even a tinge of pride to wound, 
and he had no need to prove anything to anybody. The one who had taught, Blessed is he who is not offended because of me, is being the perfect example of not being offended. Simon didn't offend Jesus. He couldn't have offended him. And this had to be something that grated against the man's pride and convicted him over his wicked little scheme. Jesus was undaunted by the hypocrite's actions. When Jesus confronted the Pharisee over his failures of hospitality, they weren't done out of anger or retribution, but out of compassion for the foolish man and the repentant woman. From this point through verse 46, Jesus lists how the Pharisee failed his duty to be a proper host and how this sinful woman had performed the duties better than Simon could have ever done. With each point, the disgrace of the man is amplified and the noble actions of the repentant woman is revealed. Jesus said, I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. In more wealthy homes, it was the responsibility of the lowest servant to wash the feet of the family and guests when they came into the house or before they sat down to eat. Since the Jews, by and large, had adopted the Greek-Roman style of eating by reclining on cushions around a common table, it was necessary to have the feet of the guests washed because they wore sandals. This surely would have been done for an honored guest. But since Simon didn't love or honor Jesus, he denied him that basic kindness. Here stands the glaring contrast where the sinner woman washes the Lord's dirty feet with her tears and wipes them dry with her hair because she had nothing else by which to dry them. Her tears had to be prolific enough to wash the Savior's feet. This indicates that her grief was intense. But as the tears of conviction, shame, and sorrow flowed, so did the release from those crushing burdens. This was an act of loving devotion, of thankfulness for the forgiveness and acceptance she was receiving from Jesus. This is just speculation, but from the woman's response, it would seem to me that she must have heard Jesus preaching somewhere, and this is what brought her to understand that he would forgive and accept her. She must have had some foundation by which to know how Jesus would receive her, for she certainly would have never done such a thing for one of the Pharisees. I don't say this in a derogatory way, but I can't imagine that she would have done this even for John the Baptist, whose fiery preaching would have intimidated her. But Jesus' message, though strong and convicting, must have contained the welcoming appeal, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What welcoming words to a weary, sin-sick soul! Notice that she came for an audience of one. She wasn't washing Jesus' feet to prove anything to anyone. When the Holy Spirit grips the heart and mind with deep conviction, everything else is forgotten. One thing becomes all-consuming, to get free from the overwhelming guilt by getting right with God. There is no rest to the wicked, but if they will turn and repent, then they will find rest at the feet of Jesus. The sinner woman wanted to get the terrible weight of sin off of her shoulders. She was being crushed by them, and she knew freedom could only come from Messiah. All those who are looking on, whether with curiosity or contempt, must have been shocked at what they saw. But this woman saw none of them and cared for none of their opinions or condemnation. She saw only Jesus and the mercy he was holding out to her, and that's all she needed. That's all she really wanted. Jesus went on to say in verse 45, You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. A kiss on the cheek was a common expression of greeting that would have been offered when a guest entered into the house. It was an expression of affection and would have been all the more done for a distinguished guest that was invited to a banquet in his honor. That the formal kiss of greeting was withheld from Jesus was another deliberate insult and clearly expressed Simon's animosity and contempt for Jesus. It can be hard to understand why people would have had such wicked thoughts and feelings about Jesus, since he was the most loving person the world has ever known. Because Christ's holy life was an offense to Simon, it reproved him of his own depravity, and the ministry of Jesus showed the Pharisee just how heartless he was about those he considered the reprobates of society. The miracles of Jesus and the anointing of the Holy Spirit on his preaching proved that Jesus was sent from God, and the Pharisee hated him for this. For a sinner woman to touch a man's feet like Simon would have been considered a sexual advance. Yet as this woman wept over Jesus' feet and kissed them, 
She felt pure, unadulterated love. When she looked into his eyes, she saw only compassion and not even a speck of wanton desire. To see and feel the purity of Christ only instilled in her that what she was doing was the first right thing she had done in a very long time. As she felt the purity of Christ's love and the Holy Spirit resting upon her while sitting at his feet, I imagine that her weeping only increased and the homage she was giving the Lord grew more true. The principal New Testament word for worship means to kiss the hand, foot, or ground. So we see this woman was worshiping Jesus. I'm not saying that she knew that he was God incarnate, but that she was giving Jesus the highest honor she knew how to give, and it wasn't misplaced. Jesus was also accepting her homage, which is an expression of the forgiveness that was flowing into her life as she was performing this act of devotion. The verse we have been looking at states that Jesus said to Simon, You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. Adam Clark claims that a better translation that's supported by some ancient manuscripts and various other translations should read, You did not give me a kiss, but since the time this woman entered, she has not stopped kissing my feet. This makes better sense for the setting. Yet there is a way that the first translation could have been done. If the woman was among some of the guests waiting for Jesus to arrive, then when she saw how disgracefully the host had treated Jesus, she took upon herself the duty to wash his feet and give him the kiss of greeting in a most humble way. The Lord continues his rebuke of Simon in verse 46, You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Anointing the head with olive oil was a mark of honor, which was bestowed upon distinguished guests. This was another very common act of hospitality that Simon deliberately withheld from Jesus to insult him. We see an expression of anointing the head in Psalms 23, verse 5. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. This is a picture of God anointing the head of an honored guest, which just so happens to be one of his adopted children. The contrast between the insolent attitude of the Pharisee and the adoring gratitude of the forgiven woman is very powerful and striking. The repentant woman uses perfumed oil that was more costly than the olive oil that was commonly used for anointing the head in such settings. According to Pliny, to anoint someone's feet was regarded as extreme luxury. Therefore, it was a greater honor to anoint the feet than the head. The woman used costly perfumed ointment to anoint Jesus' feet instead of the grade of olive oil commonly used to anoint people's heads. We can see from all this that the woman was giving Jesus the greatest homage she could afford, and our Lord's response reveals that it was acceptable to him. Just look at what the repentant woman did. Are not her actions the essence of true worship where we offer to God our very best, yet know that we haven't given him anything close to what he deserves? And isn't the heart of God so wonderfully revealed in his condescension to receive her adoration and grant her forgiveness? In verse 47, Jesus brings a conclusion to Simon's rebuke, stating, Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. The woman's great love was the result of her being forgiven, not the cause of it. We can't earn forgiveness, and we certainly don't deserve it. We are forgiven because we are loved by God and accept by faith His offer of mercy, not by any merit of our own. If God dealt with us according to what we deserve, then we would all be rotting in hell. The Apostle John told us in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, We love because He first loved us. Because the sinner woman loved herself above anyone or anything, she had given over to the sins that destroyed her life and filled her with misery. Love doesn't make something that's wicked right, since we can very easily love what's evil and forbidden. God created mankind with the capacity to love, but our love has been grossly perverted through sin. Only when we let God's redemption transform our lives will our love be redeemed, so that we might learn how to love selflessly. Yes, this woman was a great sinner, like the Lord said. Yet he sought after her, as a good shepherd does for a lost sheep that's aimlessly wandering among a pack of ravenous wolves. She didn't seek after Jesus until he sought after her through the work of the Holy Spirit. The Lord was calling her long before this glorious day, where she finally brought forth the fruit of true repentance. 
In this final rebuke aimed at the self-righteous, irate Pharisee, Jesus declared that the woman was already forgiven. As such, we don't know if her tears were the result of her repentance or the joy of receiving forgiveness. I would venture to say that they were both. The capacity of this woman to love was great, as it is of all of mankind. Her love had been focused in all of the wrong places, and her love became a form of self-abuse as she gave that love to what was forbidden. Now that she had come home to Christ, her perverted love could be healed so she could begin to love correctly, at least to a certain degree. The capacity of Simon to love was also great, but he loved himself, which left no room for the true love of God. Sure, he had sentimental feelings for God, but that came out of his self-idolatry. Because he couldn't see the fact that he too was a great sinner, he couldn't understand the tremendous gift of forgiveness the sinner woman had just received. His self-love made it impossible to love God, in spite of his being a very religious man. In this story we look in vain for any token of love on the part of Simon towards the Savior. Our love to God will be in proportion to the obligations we feel we are under for the mercy of God, and this is an extremely important point to understand. The repentant woman was beginning to live out the greatest commandment, which is to love God supremely, while the Pharisee who would have claimed that he had kept this commandment had thoroughly broken it. We don't have to practice gross sins before our conversion to be able to love Jesus to any great extent. All we need to do is understand the truth about how evil our sins actually are and how great a crime they are against God. For us sinful people, our love for God is directly tied into our understanding of the atonement and how desperately we need it. Jesus finally addressed the woman in verse 48, telling her, Your sins are forgiven. What beautiful words that she would never forget, even throughout eternity. To return to Christ's parable, a debt is not forgiven because the debtor loves his creditor, but because he cries for mercy. Love follows forgiveness, not the other way around. Jesus manifests his divinity by declaring that the woman's sins are forgiven. In verse 49, we see how people respond to this declaration. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? I think it's interesting that it was some of the guests that began to question Jesus' claim to have the authority to forgive sins, and Simon doesn't seem to be among those grumblers. My guess is that Simon was humbled enough by the Savior's rebuke that he didn't speak against Jesus, at least not that night. We can see from this story that Jesus attended a banquet knowing he would be ill-treated so that he could bring salvation to this poor woman. Though Jesus will leave the ninety-nine to seek a lost sheep, he is always laboring to bring other sheep into his fold. Every guest at that banquet was an object of his compassion, and Simon was a man being pursued by the hound of heaven. That sinner woman was wiser than all the Pharisees that attended the banquet, for she had come to learn by experience God's forgiveness that the religious elite couldn't understand. Jesus again addressed the woman and told her in verse 50, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Here everything is set right. We see that salvation came to the woman because of her faith, not because of her love. What a beautiful ending to a life of misery. The peace Jesus was giving the woman began when she made peace with God through repentance. This is when she ended her war with God. When relational peace with God was obtained, the weight of sin was washed away and then internal peace could begin to settle in the woman's life. The turmoil that runs rampant in her heart and mind can only be calmed when we make peace with God through repentance, faith, and surrender. Then the Lord will calm the raging storm within us with the words, Peace be still, and then there is sweet calm. What a wonderful Savior! Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. Under the water, in the
us no more So come wash in the river Come drink your fill Let healing walk